Hello and welcome. We're going to get started a bit early since the, the room is full and I think that's going to be better for everyone because this session is packed with, uh, with content. So just to prepare you for what, what you're in for over the next hour and ten, um, I, when I delivered this yesterday, one customer came up after, gave a pat on the back and he's like, you're going to sleep so well tonight. <laughs> he was so right. All right, so as you can see from my, my new title, I've, I've received a promotion this week to Doctor of Princesses. Um, so let me, let me tell you about that because it's, it's pretty exciting. So uh, who's been to Tableau Doctor? Yes, awesome. Okay, let me, what's, how come my screen has stopped sharing? Can't see my princess viz. This is, this is the end of the world. Um, duplicate. There we go. All right. So this is about my 16th Tableau conference, and I had single-handedly the most awesome doctor experience on, on Monday this week. So BJ Price, she's a customer speaker from Walt Disney, comes in, and uh, she brings this, this visualization, this Tableau public viz. It's called like Disney princesses, all branded in Cinderella. And uh, she's like, I need help with my calculations for my session. Um, so in Walt Disney Parks, they run these marathons. This is all public data, so I can actually, we can share it with you. Uh, and so they have the start time, uh, of like the wave that every runner uh, began in, and then you have their end time. And so from that, you can compute uh, which, which, how many people each runner overtook, and how many people overtook them. She's like, how do we calculate that? So a little bit of Tableau prep and a little bit of set actions later, uh, we arrive at, at this. So the color tells you the um, wave that they started in. So the purple ones started last. Uh, the blue ones started uh, in the first wave. Then the vertical axis is miles per hour. So how fast were they, the, they running? So these people up here were like running super fast. And then the uh, horizontal axis tells you how many people they passed. And now using this new set action feature, um, we can click on any one of these, and it will find all of the people who they passed. So this particular runner here passed 60% of the people in the race, and you can see who all of those, who all of those people are. And then obviously the ones who started out a bit earlier uh, didn't, didn't overtake anyone because they were just awesome, and they, they were at the front the whole time. Um, so this session is about showing you awesome stuff like this. Uh, what is the, the art of the possible with parameter, or that's not shipped yet, with set actions, um, as you've seen in devs on stage. Who's been to the ready, set, uh, action talk? A few people? Okay, so for the, for the rest of you, there, there's another session that gives more of a, a basic introduction to, um, to set actions, what they are, and, and so on. This is like the high speed session of, of sort of showing you the art of the possible. Yeah? Who's ready for this? Yeah. Woo! All right, let's get started. So, um, and this one is, um, it's got a bit of a statistical flair. We have uh, one of my colleagues, Nathan Manheimer, uh, teaches information visualization at University of, of Washington, and he came to London, where I live, last week, and showed me some stuff, and I was like, I need to kill my entire session and reinvent it, uh, using what you've shown me, combined with set actions, and pfft, going to hopefully blow your mind. <laughs> All right, so let's start out here. I have a data set on um, house prices in London, and they've been normalized to account for inflation, and this is going back to 1995. So let's look at just, a, a, this is just a simple visualization showing you on the vertical axis the number of properties that are sold per month versus the average normalized price of those properties. Um, and so then you can see that there's a statistically significant negative correlation. So more properties uh, sold, um, sorry, less properties correlate to uh, higher average prices. So just think about what does, that, what does that mean? What can you actually infer from that? Now, if you just look at sort of the statistics of the correlation, this might lead you to draw some, some conclusions about causation. And it's not unreasonable to think, well, as prices rise, less people can afford houses, and therefore, that's why there's less properties being sold. So it's reasonable to assume that the price is what is causing the number of properties sold to um, decrease. Right? Reasonable hypothesis, maybe? Okay, so let's look at this data in a slightly different way, using 
transparent backgrounds, new in 18.3. So here, um, <laughs> here you can see in the top uh, viz the number of properties sold over time. And then the bottom viz, it's the other axis, which is looking at the normalized price over time. So now using your, your knowledge about what, in the context of what happened in the world, you can see that immediately following the financial crisis, or actually just, yeah, pre directly preceding it, there was a huge drop off in the number of properties sold. But that was met with a massive increase in the price. So that kind of throws that hypothesis that price is driving a uh, number of properties sold out the window because does it make sense that a financial crisis driven by the housing market would cause the, pr the cost of housing to go up? Probably not, right? So who's seen the big short? All right, so here's my, you know, my kind of explanation for what's happening here. So they highlight in the big short that the, the people who suffered the most from the financial crisis are the middle class. So if, you own a, if you're a middle class and you own a property and you want to sell it and you want to buy another one, you probably have to sell your existing house to buy a new one. But if you've taken out a mortgage on a property that's 600,000 pounds and then it drops to 400,000 pounds, you probably don't want to sell it because you still owe the bank that money. And so the middle class just said, well, we're just not going to move. We're going to just stay here until things pick up. And, the, and, and so then the only people who were able to actually purchase houses uh, following the financial crisis were the wealthier tier of society where they're like, hey, the housing market's on sale. They don't need to sell a house to buy one, so they can just, they can just buy it outright. And so therefore, this is, not, this is not saying that house prices rose. It's saying that there's, I think, a selection bias in the types of people who are purchasing properties following the financial crisis. Um, and so, like visualizing the information gives you much different uh, perspective and you can bring your knowledge and context into it versus just purely looking at statistics. And all this to show you, um, look at this awesome new thing we can do now with set actions. And so we could drill in as well and see more detail about uh, what happened, not just the moving average, but the actual monthly uh, values of, of properties sold um, and so, yeah, as you, as you drill down, you get more detail, and it's kind of self-drilling, and then go back up and you get this nice summary view. Who's excited about that? Yeah! All right, it wasn't directly relevant to the, to the story, but I, I gotta show you the awesome things we can do in, in, in 2018.3 now. So who wants to see how you build something like this? Yeah! All right, good. We're gonna go do that now. So, Still showing, awesome. Okay, so here we've got our properties over time. And so I'm gonna just go and add a moving average to this, and we'll make it a 12-month moving average. Okay, so, oh yes, I forgot to show you. The, the thing that actually prompted the example uh, initially, this isn't, this isn't gonna look super disastrous, but um, s something that uh, often comes up with uh, respect to the order of operations. So if I had a f applied a filter here instead of a set action, see this, watch this here. So no filter, it's up there. Apply a filter, it's down there. So what's, what's actually happening is that when you apply a filter, it removes the prior data and your moving average doesn't consider that data. Now this doesn't look super disastrous on a stripy purple background, but I can assure you that for our, our customers working with financial data, it, this is definitely a huge deal. Um, so set actions now enable you to solve this problem because rather than filtering, um, you can create a, a more targeted filter which only applies to the moving average pill and not to the date field. And so that allows you to retain the prior context in your computation. Um, okay, so let me show you how we go about doing that. So we have our uh, moving average of properties over time. Then with our timeline, so this is just a, a heat map, we want to be able to make a selection of years and then have that um, apply as a filter to just the single measure as opposed to the entire visualization. So I'm gonna create a set from the, these uh, years here and add that to the filter shelf. So this one's now kind of self-filtering already. Um, and so then we can use this in a calculation to conditionally return 
the moving average just for the years that are in the set. So the way that that looks is we say if it's in the year set, uh, then return the, um, I made that too big, then return the, the moving average, and otherwise just let it be null. And then it's going to give an error because you can't mix aggregate and non-aggregate, so we just make this a max. It could be min, doesn't matter, it just has to be at the same level of detail as the, as the viz. So this is now your conditional moving average. And so when we then bring this into our visualization, you see that it's just returning the moving average. Um, and actually, if I overlay it, you can see it's, actually, it's computing exactly the same uh, as, as what we have um, because I'm not filtering out the, the, the previous months. So we can actually just, just remove it, remove the other one, and then Tableau does clever things and removes the null values from the time series, and so it auto-zooms in on that, on that period of time. And so now, overlaying these, let me make this not orange. Orange is not a good color. Um, let's make this white. All right, and let's make it an area. Okay, so now um, we, can, we can see this uh, overlaid, but it's static, right? I've hard-coded that set to those specific years. Now, the thing that is so powerful about set actions is that you can now bring interactivity to the consumers of a dashboard. You don't need to, it's, you don't need to set your set membership in authoring mode. You can set it in consumption mode through interaction uh, of multiple visualizations. So the way that we set this up is through a dashboard action uh, where, where we change set values here. So um, selecting a value in the timeline is going to target that year set that we created. And so now, as I make a selection, it's zooming in and then resetting to the overall uh, value. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple to do some things that previously required you to actually pre-compute your moving average in some ETL layer or Excel or custom SQL. Um, and so we've made a lot of computations dramatically easier through uh, set actions. Has anyone run into this problem before or something similar related? Yes, it's like one of those things that can consume like weeks of your life and it's like you're 99% there but you can't ship the thing because the numbers are wrong and now they don't need to be wrong anymore. So I'm super, super jazzed about this. All right, next example here. Um, so this one is looking at the uh, stock prices of the big four tech companies. Do we have anyone in the room from one of these companies today? No one. All right, we're gonna, oh yes, where are you from? From Alphabet, nice. Also known as Google, awesome. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so, he, so we have the, the stock price uh, going back to the beginning of 2017 for each of these four companies. Now, their stock prices are all correlated to each other. So you can see in this bottom view here, this is looking at uh, the daily change in value for each of the four companies versus each of the other four companies. So you can see, like for example, Facebook and Google have very, very highly correlated uh, stock prices. And that's because obviously the same macroeconomic trends will drive the stock price of all four companies. Um, However, on, on days where, where these are not correlated, so maybe one changed, uh, had a huge increase, and the others just didn't, then that could be an indication that, the, that something specific happened to that company to cause their stock price to rise. So what you can do is look at the correlation of all four companies and then identify the outliers. And the outliers should, in, in principle, be the days where something interesting happened to one of the companies, or maybe two of the companies uh, in particular. Um, okay, so we can actually perform outlier detection through cluster analysis, through Tableau's native built-in cluster analysis. So cluster analysis is a way of statistically grouping uh, days together. So, so uh, in, you know, visually you can group days together along two axes, but because we're trying to group them on four axes, you can't necessarily visually perceive that grouping. You need statistics to compute it for you. So that's what cluster analysis does. Um, so then what you can do is say, well, generate loads of clusters. Like in this case, generate 50 clusters, and then I wanna find the clusters that don't have that many days in it. 
because those are the outliers. So this Pareto chart is showing you uh, here that 14% of the days fall into this particular cluster. Um, and you know, up to, so up to the 90th, yeah, the 90th percentile, um, these are all your sort of inlier days, whatever the, the opposite of outlier is. I think it, yeah, we, well, let's call it that. So, so for example, if you click on this cluster, you can see it's now highlighting on the background of the, of the trends um, when those specific days occurred. And then you can see it's also identifying like the center of every single one of the, the scatter plots. So clearly not the outliers. Um, if we then go to, to here, um, up to the sort of 90th percentile, I didn't quite get it all, but up to the 90th percentile gives you your outliers. So you can see those are like a lot more scattered. And so specifically if we wanted to find the, the kind of really extreme cases, so like this cluster only has one day in it. Um, so if we pick out you know, some of these extreme outliers here, then, then we can go and, and explore what actually happened on those days. So if I go and auto zoom into this, this period of time here, you can see looking at all of them, like what might be the cause of that being an outlier, right? Because statistics can compute that there was an outlier, but then you as a human need to explain why is it an outlier and what happened. So you can see that on this day here, uh, Facebook stock price dropped by uh, 19%. So if we just go and drill into this and then see, well, what actually happened on this day? Um, now it's launching a web search and uh, showing you that it's stuck, it shatters faith in tech companies. Facebook suffers its worst day ever. Um, so, Clearly statistics works, that it actually went and identified that, that particular outlier. Um, it's interesting when you start to read through these, you're like, is this related to all the media stuff around Facebook? And it's actually not, it's 100% related to, related to their earnings. Um, and this is what I found the most interesting about this exercise is that the things you think drive stock price just don't. Um, so if we look at uh, this particular one here, Let's kind of zoom in on this area. So here you can see that fa Facebook's always the outlier. They increase by 9% in, uh, in a single day. And so then if we go and see, well, what happened on that particular day? Um, what is it? Where was it? There was, uh, yes, Facebook surges. Uh, where is it? After sending upbeat message to Wall Street. So Wall Street drives this so much more than the public. Um, and then where was the other one? This one's quite interesting here. So on this day, uh, Facebook again had a 5% uh, drop. So if we go and look into, well, what, what, what happened on that particular day? Um, here, it's making changes to its news feed. And uh, where is it? Yeah, it's, th there's, yeah it's, it's stock dips after the platform deprioritizes publishers. So again, it's commercial agreements and so on. Nothing, nothing here about any of the things that we hear in the media. I just thought that was super interesting. Um, and, and that's just a great example of how data can prove your assumptions wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so who wants to see how you build this one? Yeah, okay, good. That's, that's coming right now. Uh, first, I'm going to just have like uh, three seconds to talk about something super boring but super important. So in the, the, the data source, the way that the data is structured is according to the blue bars here. So you have one field for the stock, and then you have one field for the percent change of that stock. But in order for us to perform cluster analysis, in fact, this is true when you're doing the majority of statistical analysis on um, even outside of Tableau um, in, in any tool you need to convert the data into a wide form instead of a long form so that you have one field for every single value, right? So here I've created four calculations that give you Facebook's change, Amazon's change, Apple's change, and Google's change because you need those four, four separate measures in order to correlate them and create the, those cluster analyses. So specifically, the, the calculations to do that is just to conditionally return the percent change for each of the, of the stocks. So when the stock is Amazon, return the percent change and let it be null otherwise. So that's kind of a, a core thing that you could do this in Tableau prep as well if, if, if you needed to. Um, okay, so let's get rid of this now here and then go and turn this into a nice,
scatter plot matrix. And then we want to look at this broken down by the days and add in that trend line and then you can see that they're all very highly statistically significantly correlated to one another. So now to perform that cluster analysis, we can just simply drag in this, this cluster here. And it's by, by default created uh, three clusters and you can see here uh, very clearly that it's, it's doing a statistical grouping because sometimes you see here like this blue one is sort of in the red area. Um, but then you can see like, well, where is it falling in other clusters? Um, so we don't want to, to perform outlier detection. You need to have a huge number of clusters. So let me go and amp this up to, uh, whoa, that's a lot of color. Let's, let's, do, let's do not a trend line per color. Um, <laughs> whoa. Okay. Let's just not have trend lines. How about that? Oh, my God. Okay, wait. Let me just go back, back. Pardon me? Yes, that's, that's, yeah. Um, let me go back to the point when there was no trend lines. Okay, let's just do the, let's just do the clusters. Okay. So we have then our 50, 50 clusters. And so then we want to persist this back into the data source so that we can reuse it to do other things. Um, and yeah, we don't actually need that on color. Okay, so if we come to our, uh, to, to now, basically we wanna count the number of days that belong in each of these um, clusters. So I'll do a, a distinct count of dates, and then you can start to um, create a Pareto on that. So, so specifically the way to do outlier detection is kind of look for the uh, 90th percentile and beyond. So we can compute that um, by doing a running total and then looking at the percent of the running total. Um, as well. All right. So then we have the, so then we can go and find the outliers. So if we just look for the 90th percentile, so this cluster onwards, that's going to be your outliers. So we can go and create a set on that, and let's call this our outliers. All right. And then let's go back here and then add that into our visualization and then you can spot you know, where, the, where the, the outliers are. So now the interesting thing is to overlay on uh, the, the trend line where those specific days are so you can see like what actually happened uh, to each of the stocks. So we can now use this um, outlier set on one of these um, line chart, yeah, the, tr the trends here, to just plot a, a line on every single day that is in the outlier set. So the way that we'll do that is, is basically create a new axis between zero and one, and then just return a one for days that are outliers and zero otherwise. So you can use the set in a calculation to conditionally return uh, ones and zeros based on whether it's uh, in or out of the set. Now, I should also mention the syntax is kind of odd and not immediately intuitive, but a set is, is essentially a Boolean, true, false. So in means true, out means false. And so the conditional statement in any kind of if or case statement is always, always has to be a Boolean, true or false. And so therefore you can just directly reference a set. Um, and the set, whether, it, whether the thing belongs to the set is, is a condition. So this is now going to be our outlier days. And so then we can grab this and go and check it in here and then fix the axis to be exactly between uh, zero and one. And then let's make that a bar with a width of exactly one, and then we can go and overlay this on this visualization here, and then just stick it underneath the, the line chart. Um, and there you have your outlier days, nice and highlighted. So then just repeat this on the, on the other chart. And then um, here, so what's, at the moment I've hard-coded that to the, the 90th percentile. 
But now you can make this interactive because some of those outliers are more like outliers than others. And so again, this is where set, the set action comes into play where you can let an end user actually interact and, and see, you know, do they just want to see the, the, the last 10th percentile or do they want to see the, or, sorry, the, the 90th percentile or do they want to look at the 99th percentile? And so we can apply the set action um, where the selecting the, the percentile on the Pareto chart is going to update, uh, hold on, and where, what did I call this, number two. Um, yeah, where it's going to update the outlier set. And so now if I go and pick a few of these, whoop, then it's just going to show you the, the data points specifically for those days. So it's now an interactive outlier detection as opposed to just a static outlier detection. All right, the next one. This one is my favorite. Okay, so this is a stock uh, comparison or stock similarity tool. So the idea is to be able to pick a stock and then go and look through all the other stocks and find the ones that are most highly correlated with your selected stock. So at the moment, what's being displayed is the stocks that are most highly correlated with the market on average. Um, but then if I want to drill into one of those, so let's say, anyone from Accenture here today? No one. All right, I'm going to drill into Accenture. And so now it's gone and uh, computed all of the stocks that are most highly correlated with Accenture. And then I think, well, maybe, what about Boeing? So I can select Boeing, and then at the moment my correlation range is anything that's positively or negatively correlated um, of, with a correlation of 0.97 or above. So correlation of one or minus one means like perfect correlation or perfect inverse correlation. Um, and so, yeah, the closer you get to one, the more highly correlated they are. Now, there's not a ton of stocks that have shown up here, so I can just go and decrease that and then add some more. So anything that's correlated within 0.96 or not. And then the blue tells you that it's positively correlated, so it's going in the same direction. And the purple tells you that it's going in the opposite direction. So General Electric is going in exactly the opposite direction. And then that one, the majority of the ones that GE is correlated to, it's inversely correlated to, um, such as PayPal. And so you can just like iteratively explore um, the, 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 the data here and kind of increase or decrease the range depending on how many stocks that's, that's correlated with. Or equally, you could come in here and search for a particular one. My resolution is doing crazy things. Hold on, let me remove it from, nope, my resolution is still doing crazy things, so you guys know how filters work, but <laughs> uh, yeah, you could search for one. So for example, if you wanted to know uh, what is correlated with uh, Tableau, then we can see that um, Intuit, MasterCard, Salesforce, um, and, and, and so on. So you can come in and search for your own company as well if you want to. Um, this is on Tableau Public, so yeah, go play with it. it. You can just lose hours just clicking on things. That's so fun. All right. Whoa, Microsoft has a lot going on. Okay, so who wants to see how you build such a thing? <laughs> Woo! All right. Okay, so um, starting out here with just by, just by looking at the, the average close price um, by every stock. So the first thing we need is to pick a reference stock. So let's go and uh, I'm going to just make a selection now and hard code it against Alphabet for our good friend at the back. Um, okay, so this is going to be uh, my stock. And so now we need to conditionally return the close price for that stock so that we can then compare it against the co close price of all the other stocks. So the calculation is, uh, once again, very similar to the other things we've done where we just say, you know, if it's in the stock then return the close price, and then otherwise just don't do anything. So this now gives you the close uh, for my stock. And so then if we grab that and bring it into the view, you'll see that it's, it's returning the value for alphabet uh, and then null everywhere else. So now we need to be able to look at a daily level and then compare the daily uh, 
price of alphabet to the daily price of all the others. So uh, just to make this um, good, good trick to, to know is um, just kind of as you're doing your calculations, filter the data, and then you can bring in more staff to work out what you're doing, and you don't have to wait for it to compute across everything. So um, I want to add in the day here. Let me drag this in. <clears throat> and so I want to take this number here and then propagate it across all day, all, like the entire partition for that day, so that I can then make a row level comparison that compares this number to this number. So the way you can use the level of detail expressions to propagate data across a, a partition. So specifically what we want to do is, is, is fix that number at the day level. So you can say here, um, fix to the date, the, um, not the maximum, let's do average in, in case you pick multiple stocks. And so this is now, uh, let's call this compared comparison. And so that now, if we bring this in, is going to take that number and then replicate it across the entire partition. So you can see here it's 786.9, and so it's giving the, the correct number for, the, for every partition. So we don't actually need this anymore. We now have the, the full uh, calculation. And so then we want to correlate um, this value and this value. So we can use the correlation function uh, to correlate the close value um, with the, our comparison value. And wait a second. Pardon me? Close. Comparison is definitely this one. I definitely want to correlate that and that. Uh, no, I want the close of, hold on. If I remove the date, oh yeah, it's because I had the date, no, because so, you want to do the, sorry, my bad, yes. You want to do the correlation at the stock level. Um, you can't really correlate two single numbers. Yes, obviously. Okay, so remove the date and then it's doing the correlation at the stock level. So it's looking at, now you have, I don't know, 300, like about 700 days behind, 700 data, there's 700 days in here, so it's doing the correlation across those 700 data points and then giving this number. Um, so that now gives you your correlation uh, function. And so now we need to be able to use that to actually filter our, our visualization. So at the moment it's an aggregate, it's computing just in this one viz, but I want to be able to use it in a different viz that has the, all the time series. Um, so rather than relying on the sheet to perform the aggregation, I want to just always aggregate at the stock level. And so then you write a level of detail expression to do that. So um, specifically, I always use visualizations to figure out like how to write LOD expressions. You can kind of translate a viz into an LOD by just saying, what measures do I have and what dimensions do I have? So I want to fix this. Whoa. Not like that. So I want to fix this to the dimension of my viz and specifically this aggregation. So this now gives you the, the correlation uh, per stock. And so then you want to use that and, and the filters to identify any correlation that's above your selected parameter value in, ab in absolute terms. So then we can use this to create our uh, filter. And so that's going to say, um, it, we want to look at the absolute value so you can also find like perfect negative correlations. So when the absolute value of that is greater than, let's say greater or equal to your um, correlation range is the parameter here. That becomes your filter. And so then just to check if this is doing sensible things, we can color here and it identifies just this one here. Well, yeah, okay, so it doesn't have a, a correlation above 0.97 for any of the kind of sample values that I have in here. So it's only returning the one for the stock itself. Um, but then, yeah, let's remove this filter and then we want to filter instead by that condition. And we no longer need any of these. We really want to look now at the close value across time. We. Um, so let's do that. Okay. And so, um, and let's add an independent axis for each row or column. Cool. So 
uh, that's like almost there. Now we just need to um, add the ability to trellis this into a matrix because that's way more interesting than having a giant long list. Who wants to see how to do that? Yes! Okay. So we're going to do it through. So essentially what you need to do is assign an XY coordinate to every single uh, stock. So you want to sort your stocks by, like, so the highest valued stocks are at the top and the lowest valued stocks are at the bottom. So then things that are kind of similar in price end up being on the same axes because you have like one axis per row. Um, so if you want to have like a width of um, five, let's say, for your columns, you can do this with the modulo function. So index will just, it will count, it will just assign, um, it counts basically from one up to n. Um, index modulo five, it calculates the remainder when you divide by five. So it goes zero, one, two, or one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four, zero. So this becomes the um, column kind of indicator. Okay, so if we br bring this now into our viz, we'll make it discrete. And so then you'll notice here that what, yeah, zero, one, two, I think, yeah, zero, one, two, three, okay. That's working, I'll just show you a thing where this stuff gets really wonky if you have missing dates, because um, it'll then split part of your time series into another one, so um, what, you, what you really want in, in this case is to, say, compute this at the name level, which means it then ignores the date and doesn't increment along date, it only increments along the name, so that ensures the entire time series has the same index for, for a particular stock. Okay, so yeah, no, that makes sense. It's doing one, two, three, four here. So then for our, let me add some more data in uh, here so that we have multiple rows. Um, so then what you wanna do, if I just fit this here, is, is assign for these ones, they all need to have the same row index so that they belong to the same row and then these ones need to have the same row index and so on. Um, so the way that you can compute that is by identifying um, where does the columns become uh, equal to uh, one, and that tells you that it should belong to a new row. And so you wanna then increment the value for that new row. So if um, the columns value is equal to one, then, uh, so previous value is like a, a self-referencing function. So previous value zero means if I'm looking at the first row, just give it a value of zero. Um, and then in this case, I specifically wanna increment it in the case where the columns is equal to one. And then otherwise, I just wanna keep the, the previous value so that it repeats along um, and then end. And so this becomes your rows value. Oh wait, there's an error. Why are you else, else previous value, thanks. So that becomes your rows and then let's make this discrete and then bring this in here, and then we're gonna have to do the same, whoa. Let's just do that so you can see like, it's now, it's incrementing along every single day. So this is the case, again, where you wanna say like, ignore the date in how you're doing the, the calculation and then just specifically compute this at the name level. Um, and so then it, it ensures that one specific name has the, the same value. So now you can see it's, giving a row value of one up until here, and then it changes to two, and, and so on. So now that's, that's computing correctly, so you can then drop name to detail, and then use rows and columns on your rows and columns. And then it's already set to an independent axis range. Zero is like five, so we'll move that over, and now you have a nice trellised chart. So finally, to make this interactive where you can pick a stock and then have it recompute relative to that selected stock, we can add in the action where you update the set with your selection. Um, so specifically, I wanna target our, my stock. And then as we pick this, that becomes the new reference point. And then we could sort of color by, um, 
an attribute. Can I put a, this on a tooltip? It doesn't. Yeah, you want to color by this is a random thing. You can put a calculation on attribute and not a set. Don't ask why. Um, I'm unsure. <laughs> then color by that. And the reason for using uh, attribute is because uh, otherwise, if you just use the set, it will break your calcs because then you have to reset up your partitions and so on. Anyway, okay, so there we have it. The stock similarity tool. Boom. <laughs> All right, continuing on uh, the spirit of, of stock analysis. So this top view here is, um, it looks like a color legend, but it's actually a, a viz that lines up all of your stocks according to their average daily percent change. Um, so if I want to look at, ooh, that was Tableau there. Tableau, 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 no. This is not good for search. All right, never mind. Um, so if I want to look at which are the, stocks that have the highest uh, average close, I can just pick that section of the legend. So now it's displaying um, all of those ones here. And so, um, did I, I think I didn't pick the very, very edge cases, which I totally need to, oh no, it's there. Okay, so these are all the stocks that have a, high, a kind of high average um, uh, daily return. But what's interesting is if you look at this specific stock here, which is not a company I learned yesterday, but a fund. Um, so this fund has a really, is one of the highest in terms of its average daily close value, but then if you look, if you, it's actually decreasing. So just simply looking at aggregate numbers can, can sometimes tell you like really misleading things. And it's because if you have a huge spike, just one huge spike that can highly skew your average, while the majority of other days it's, it's declining. Um, so what this is doing here is looking at, for a particular stock, is it, is it increasing um, at a faster rate than the market, or is it decreasing at a faster rate than the market? Because if you just look at a single stock in isolation, you might see its, its stock price rising and think like, oh, that company is so special, but actually it could just be like the market is rising in that industry in general. Um, so you, to draw that kind of conclusion, you have to compare it against what's happening in the world, not just look at the stock in isolation. So, so clicking on this one, what it shows you is that um, on 40% of days, this stock had a higher daily return than the market in general. But on 56% of days, this, the market in general had a higher daily return than this particular stock. And then um, this histogram is, is really showing you the, the actual distribution. So on the x-axis, um, Okay, so the frequency part is the number of stocks. So there's like 900 stocks in this data set. And so for each stock, it's grouping them into a, a, a bucket on the horizontal axis of like how many days was our selected stock above that, that particular stock versus how many days was the other stock above our selected stock. So when the, the red is highly skewed to the right, it means that on more days, um, com other companies were above our stock. Um, whereas when you have something that's skewed to the left, such as for uh, Tableau, <laughs> it shows you that uh, Tableau was above the market on more days than the market was above Tableau. So you can actually look at skews of distributions to, to, identify, um, to identify that. Um, who wants to see how this one's built? Yeah, okay, get ready for a calcathon. Like this thing, there's a lot of LODs in this. Um, okay, so let me remember how to do this. <laughs> okay, so the first is we need to pick a reference stock. And we need to know what the change is for that reference stock, which we then need to compare to the, all the other stocks. So the, the first thing is let's go and, and pick a, a random stock here and make a set out of it. So my stock again. Um, so then I want to conditionally return, in this case, not the, not the close value, but the percent change for that particular stock. So if it's my stock, then we want to return the percent change, and then otherwise just nothing. So this is now the daily change for my stock. And so that's going to parse out um, that value and then just be null 
everywhere else. So then now we need to compare that on a daily level. So let me just, again, re restrict this to a, a particular subset here. Because uh, now we want to see, uh, by day, uh, take that number and then again propagate it across the entire partition, like across all companies for that given day, so that we can then at a row level compare each company's um, daily change to this specific number. And they need to be in the same row to make that, that comparison. So then we will make a level of detail expression, so it's pretty similar to the other case where you fix to the date level the um, average uh, daily change for our selected stock. So this will be, let's call this again our comparison. Okay, and so if we bring this in, that's now copying that number across that partition. So we don't need this anymore, that's gonna be the one that we compare. And so then you wanna take the difference between this number and this number. So specifically, if um, our, our kind of com comparison, I should call it, it's like our reference point, let's say. It's, yeah. Mm. Okay, so if our uh, reference point is higher than the kind of average um, percent change, then our stock is above. Let me make this a bit bigger. Um, and then if the percent change of the other companies is above our reference point, then that means our stock is below. And then otherwise, they are equal. Okay, so this becomes our, let's call it a bin. And so this should, if we drop this onto color, do some reasonable things. Um, so, so actually, if I remove this and remove this and then count the number of days, you should now get, for every single stock, it should add up to whatever, however many days there are in here, I guess, okay, five, 500 or whatever. And so then it's now showing you for each one of these stocks, uh, on, this, on this many days, it was, da -da, let me just make these colors more uh, intuitive with how we reason about these things. So this particular stock was above our stock on 249 days, it was below our stock on 230, uh, uh, two, 203 days, and they were exactly equal in terms of their daily change on 16 days. So now, now what do we wanna do? Now we want to actually take a, that number, because that's gonna become the horizontal axis in the histogram. Uh, this, this is the thing that you want to bin the number of stocks by. So continuing on from this um, level of reasoning of how do I translate a sheet into a, a level of detail expression that can then be used <coughs> in another sheet to group other things by, rather we don't want this count of, this, at the moment this count distinctive date is a measure, but we want it to become a dimension that we can then group number of days by. And so you need to convert it into an, an LOD expression in order to use it as a dimension. So specifically, converting this sheet into an LOD is just fixing it to the dimension, the LOD of the viz, which is these two dimensions, and then um, counting the aggregation. So this now becomes the uh, number of days um, per stock uh, bin. And so then, now we want to, let me go and remove these things here. We wanna look at this and then group the uh, number of stocks by the number of days. And I'll remove the ones that are equal. Oh yeah, let's remove that filter so we have them all back. And so now you can see that you actually have these sort of histograms, but they're like kind of odd overlaying each other. So if you wanna reverse them, rather than having one measure in a dimension, we need to create two measures, one for stocks that are above and one for stocks that are below. So then what you can do is um, conditionally return the stocks uh, for each of the bins. So when the bin is equal to above, then you wanna return the stocks that fit that case, and then you wanna count them. Um, 
And so a common thing that people do is put the count distinct around the stock, and then you get this error of like, cannot mix aggregate and non-aggregate. So the trick is to put the count distinct around the entire if statement. Um, okay, so this is now the number of stocks uh, above. And so then we can just go and duplicate that and then modify it, uh, the copy, for the case where it is um, below. And then we can grab those two things. Oops, so this one and then this one and then just reverse the axis with a negative. Let's remove that thing. And then you can dual axis and synchronize these and then remove measure names, and then you have your histogram. <laughs> cool, so then, now the next thing is, how do I make this histogram interactive? Because I don't want to always, at the moment, it's hard-coded to that Raven or whatever stock it was. Um, and so let's go grab, duh, 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 which one was it? There it is. So if we grab this thing here, now we want to set up a set action so that picking a thing in the matrix updates the reference stock to be whatever stock I've picked. And so this is again where like set actions are a relatively small part of this example, but it's the thing that makes it interactive and useful for other people. Um, so we're going to select something from the stock selection matrix and then I think it's this data source. Um, so now when I pick one of these, it's now computing uh, relative to that selected stock. Boom. <laughs> All right. Okay, the next example, I'm gonna take you on the journey of V1 of this dashboard and then the V2 will make more sense. <laughs> um, all right, so I have blended together two different data sets that I thought would be really interesting to, to correlate. So one of them is da uh, data on the player, the value of all the players who played in the World Cup, and then also the rank of those teams in FIFA in general. So the, their FIFA rank is um, I, I, something, I started reading about it and was like, this is super complicated, but whatever. Basically, it's a, a score that FIFA keeps track of all of the games that they play in all kinds of different tournaments over time. Um, and then I also wanted to see how does that compare to where each team actually finished in the 2018 World Cup. So in the scatter plot on the left, you have uh, for a, a dot for every team, and then the vertical axis shows you what is their rank, their FIFA rank in general. So that's kind of the historic rank. Um, and then the horizontal axis tells you what's the market value of that team. And so obviously there's a really high correlation here Team, teams that have higher market value um, in general have a higher FIFA rank. But then you have teams like Peru that have a super low market value, but a super high FIFA rank because you know, the, the sum of the parts does not make the whole. Just because you have lots of good players um, doesn't mean that they play well together as a team. So Peru is sort of evidence of, of that. And then on this side here, you have the rank of where they placed uh, in the 2018 World Cup versus their, their market value. So then you can, you can segregate the teams. So um, these teams here are consistently above expectations, whereas these teams here were better in the World Cup, um, but in general, they tend to be uh, below kind of the, the expectations. These, uh, these teams here are like consistently below expectations, uh, whereas these teams here are in general quite good, but then in the World Cup they performed uh, below expectations. So that was interesting, but then I thought, you know, just kind of like slicing the world into four quadrants, uh, you lose a lot of information because when you look at a team like Germany, they were like drastically, drastically worse in the World Cup than where they are in general, um, versus if you look at a team like Brazil, they were like, they're just so close to the line that it's almost not different. Um, so th then I was wondering, well, what I would really like to do is put these two ranks on a common axis and then see the movement in, uh, in their values. Um, and so that is what version two does here. Wow. 
So the ranks are obviously different. The FIFA ranks are on a scale of like 1 to 70 or something. Uh, but the World Cup ranks are on a scale of 1 to 8, because there's only like eight kind of levels that you can go through. So the first thing is you have to put them on a common axis by, by looking at a rank percentile as opposed to just strictly a, um, a rank. And so then you can see, obviously, there's still this high correlation between their rank and their market value, but then you can see um, where, they, where they started and where they kind of went to. So Saudi Arabia uh, what made like a huge leap in the World Cup versus where they are in general. So now selecting Saudi Arabia is filtering to display uh, all of the countries where their like in increase, their relative increase was higher, right? Because we always look at the world in terms of absolutes, like France won, Croatia won. But like a lot of teams did very, very well given their starting position. And so let's, you know, give kudos to them as well. Um, and so Saudi Arabia did better in terms of their kind of relative change than all of these other countries here. And then the color is telling you um, what the market value of that country versus Saudi Arabia's market value. So when it's green, it means that that country is, has a higher market value than Saudi Arabia. So you, you can see from this that not only did they outperform loads of teams, they also outperformed loads of teams that are significantly more valuable than them. Um, if we look at uh, Sweden, for example, you see that they also outperformed lots of teams, but now the blue ones are ones that are uh, less valuable than Sweden in terms of market value. Um, so the one who did the best is Russia, um, the host of the, of the World Cup. They beat every single country uh, just in their relative change, but then they started out like in the 99th percentile of their FIFA rank, so they had, they had a long way to go. <laughs> um, the country who did the worst, is any Germans in the room? Ah, oh, sorry for this, sorry for this. I have a ton of German friends, so I just really love to show this to them. <laughs> Germany outperformed no one. <laughs> All right, so who wants to see how we make this? All right. Um, didn't get to this one yesterday, so glad you guys came to the, the one where we could start earlier. Okay, so um, now I have to remember how to do this. So the first thing <laughs> is we want to, we need to compute a rank percentile. So we'll, we'll convert the um, rank into a rank percentile for the, um, the World Cup rank. And then for the FIFA rank, you can't strictly do a rank percentile because there's lots of teams who didn't play in the World Cup uh, so we need to account for them as well. So you actually have to just divide the, the best you can kind of do here is divide the FIFA rank by uh, the maximum FIFA rank. So that's going to be a, a window max of the, the FIFA rank. So that will give you your percentile of uh, FIFA rank. I mean, this could be off because there could be a country with a super low rank that's not in this data set, but this will work for the, the purpose of this example. Okay, so that is going to become our axis here, and then we will compute that using the team. And then let's go and put these on a, a single axis. Uh, synchronize and, uh, yeah. And then I wanna reverse it um, so that the kind of high ranks are at the top. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, and the trend lines we just want uh, one overall. Let's say, oh no, ah, trend lines. Just don't include that as a factor. Ah. Okay. Why are you being so annoying? Just remove it. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we need to connect the teams. The yeah, the connect the team to to itself. Actually, wait. Sorry. What I should have done is that. Then you have just one axis. That's much easier. And then reverse this one. OK. So to connect it, we will convert it into a line chart and then put measure names on the size and then reverse it so that it, the, big, the big side is the World Cup rank. So you can, because you're kind of showing like where are they going. Um, and then the color is the difference between 
the two rank percentiles. Um, so this, let me just persist this one back as well. It will be simpler. So this is rank of World Cup. And so then you want to uh, subtract, hold on, the, I think you want the FIFA rank minus the rank of the World Cup, uh, not FIFA, the percentile of FIFA rank minus the rank of the World Cup. And that becomes your difference. And then if we put this on color, and then it's automatically computed along team. And so, yes, that's exactly right. If we do like a, a red-green, Germany is very red, Russia is very green. So that's, that's that one. Um, and so, <laughs> yay. <laughs> okay, so then <laughs> we need to be able to compute based on, a, again, we don't want to filter the map. We want to pick a selection and then filter the map based on the difference of that selection. So we need a set on a particular team. So here I'm going to pick Peru. So this is my uh, selected team. And so then we need to compute the difference for that selected team. So if, if, if it's that selected team, then compute their difference. Uh, so that becomes, oh right, and it needs to be like this. So uh, this is the difference for the uh, selected team. And so then for this one, at the moment it's just returning the, the, the value for that one team. And so then you want to take you want to propagate that value so you can compare it to all other teams. So then if you do a uh, window max or window average or window anything, um, that will propagate it across all other teams. So let's call this the reference uh, diff. And so that should, whoops, where to go? In theory, now if I set this to compute using the team, it's now copying that value across all of the other teams. And so then you can say where, uh, let's call this the filter condition. So where the reference diff is greater than just the difference, uh, which one was it, the thing on color, then just the difference, then you want to uh, keep those cases. And so then we can go to our map and see the reference diff put this on whoops no what did I call it I called it filter yes it's trying to make things simple so just set that to compute using the team and then when we filter to that this should show us now all of the teams that Peru outperformed and so then the last thing is ah wait let me remove these things from here so now again, it's like the interesting thing is to now make this dynamic so that I can make a selection in here and have that update which countries are being displayed. So now we just need to set up the set action so that picking, uh, which one is it, the rank percentile, yeah, targets, oh man, uh, what did I call this data source? <laughs> Player market value, it must be that, no, it's not that, five, this one. Um, yeah. And so then, oh no, and I want to clear uh, everything from the set when I haven't made a, a selection, because otherwise, what does it really mean? Um, there we go. So now you can see who they're beating, and Russia has everyone, and Germany has no one, so it's definitely working. <laughs> All right, last example. Um, this is to get you excited for 2019.1. Uh, parameter actions. Uh, so this example here is looking at London housing data. So one thing I wanted to look at is the turnover of new properties. Um, there's not many new properties in, in, in London. It's like 5% of the properties are, are new builds and the rest are from like the 1800s. So, um, <laughs> so, so in, in this visualization, the, the, the top purple bar chart is just showing you the number of new properties sold over time. Um, so then what, you have the address in the data source, so it's interesting to see for that cohort of addresses, when are they resold? 
Is it that people are holding on to these properties for a really long time and like living in them, or is it just a bunch of landlords are like purchasing and flipping them um, repeatedly? So here, this is showing you that in 1995, there was like 5,800 new properties sold. Then the viz below shows you that of those um, properties, um, how many were resold in 1996? So 246 of the 5,800 were sold one year later. Um, by 1999, 884 were sold of the 5,000. And so that represents 15% of new properties, 15% uh, of properties that were new in 1995 were resold in 1990, or four years later. Um, and then this is showing you cumulatively. So by 1999, uh, 2,332 of that 5,800 properties were resold, which as a percent of total means that 40% of the 1995 cohort was sold four years later. So then by you know, 10 years later, 105% were resold. Um, and that's because they get resold multiple times. You, if someone can figure out how to visualize whether it's like different properties being resold or the same ones, like you should run the conference. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so 23 years later, like now, 167% of the 1995 properties have been resold. So then you can see like, well, how is this changing in 1996 and 1997? And the interesting one to watch is that Pareto in the bottom, which you can see it's been put on a common baseline because here you're looking at like relative how many years later, which means that you can actually make the comparison of like how is turnover of properties changing over time? And like by the time you get to 2018 is going to have nothing. I shouldn't have clicked on that. Um, but yeah, by the time you get to like later years, like almost nothing is being resold. And so I have this GIF to, to show you what happens. If anyone here has any performance problems, I can definitely recommend uh, video editing software. It is guaranteed to work 100% of times. But <laughs> you can see that Pareto declining. And my hypothesis is because um, the government's introduced this stamp duty tax where when you sell a property, you have to pay 5% of the value to the government. So a million pound house has a $50,000 transaction fee. So obviously you're not going to want to resell it. They're doing that to, ins it's uh, ironically to incentivize like homeowners and to remove landlords from the, the market. And so there you have uh, government policy in action. All right, I don't have time to go through that one, but with parameter actions, that, that becomes very, um, well, not easy, but doable. <laughs> All right, so uh, in the last minute, just one thing I want to uh, say. Um, I, I am really interested in understanding, like, what are all of the unsolved problems that you guys are facing out there? Um, so that I can go and harangue engineers to build awesome things, such as set actions. Um, so. If you have any interesting scenarios, please get in touch. I will work in exchange for information. So uh, some examples. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but just some examples. If you're doing anything around complex time and event calculations and data modeling, I definitely want to talk to you. If you have scroll bars in your calculations, we must talk. Um, if you're doing things, your workbooks have tons of blending across many data sources. You need to use level of detail expressions to correct aggregations, or you're building these scaffolding tables, kind of artificial tables, to make sure you don't lose data via joins. We have some new data modeling stuff in alpha that we need uh, testers for. Um, if you're doing any kind of analysis of relationships across high dimensional data sets, if you're looking at, you know, if your unit of measurement is a patient and not a dollar, then that comes with all kinds of interesting problems. Um, if you're trying to use Tableau as a calculation engine to do scenario planning um, and analysis, I'm interested. Um, if you've done something like build a pricing model in an ETL layer and you want a selection in Tableau to dynamically trigger that, that kind of model, we should talk. Um, if you're trying to build interactive data science applications or do anything around write back for like mark level commenting or workflow or things of that nature or um, you need to set up some complex alerting logic, um, or you want to use Tableau as a temporary relational cache for web service responses, or just any product feedback in general, please contact me. I will de I'm very interested in helping you. Um, and so with that, uh, please complete 
the session survey results, and we've just ended only two minutes over time. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of conference. <laughs>